Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the PCMA annual lunch meeting and our November program. We're really thankful and excited you're all here today. Um, we have an awesome program for you and some out-of-town guests that will be speaking on a panel. Also, all of you that are, that are attending via our, our webinar, we, we're streaming this meeting. So for all of you in the future, if you cannot make one of our PCMA educational meetings, you can stream online. Thank you to Shepherd AV for sponsoring that program for us at each meeting and making that possible. I'd like to, at this time, I'd like to give Marion Welsh a very warm welcome, a former colleague of mine, and thank her for sponsoring uh, this venue and for hosting our lunch program today. So Marion, if you'd come up, please. Well, welcome. It's so good to see so many familiar faces that I haven't seen in a long time. And uh, hope you all have a great lunch today. I know it's going to be very productive and very interesting. You know, um, I've been involved with PCMA for a number of years. And I've, I've enjoyed every minute of, of it. And for those new members who are, are just joined or maybe you're considering joining, it will be the most remarkable experience for you in your professional career. It's fun, you've got great people, they become your friends, they become your professional friends. So um, I go on and on, I'm a big champion of this organization, so have a good time today and we'll look forward to seeing you maybe at the National Convention and certainly at other luncheons away, luncheons down in the future. So I wanna welcome you to the Cobb Energy Performing Arts Center. Uh, this is your home for the Atlanta Opera, the Atlanta Ballet, great performances and educational outreach through the Arts Bridge Foundation, who are the producers of the uh, Schuler Hensley Awards that some of you may have seen on PCMA, uh, it, on uh, um, the uh, Georgia Public Radio, um, comes on uh, in April. Uh, the Cop Galleria Center is proud to have this beautiful gem in our portfolio, as well as the Battery, SunTrust Park, home of our great Atlanta Braves, and all of the hotels, the restaurants, the merchants, and entertainment venues that complete Atlanta's sweet spot. We want to thank you, the meeting and trade show community, for 25 years of support and patronage, and we can't wait to show you what the future will bring here in Cobb County. Thank you so much. Enjoy your lunch. Chef Walker's made a special menu for you all, so enjoy and have a great day. Thank you, Marion. And our second sponsor for today is Pamela Shepard and the Los Angeles uh, Convention and Vis Visitors Bureau. So Pamela, thank you for hosting and for sponsoring this meeting. And please take a few minutes to tell us about your awesome city. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, I can mimic a lot of what was just said being in this association and the industry and all the other associations for many, many years. Um, <clears throat> I want to get up here today and in addition to telling you how fabulous PCMA is, um, not necessarily talk to you just about Los Angeles, but to talk to all of you about you um, and the value of partnerships. Uh, these associations bring a lot of partnerships and our industry does that naturally. But many of you in this room, suppliers or planners, um, it's really about partnerships. And I know from a planner standpoint, you might reach out often to your hotel partners, your GSOs, NSOs. You might reach out to your DMCs more often than maybe you reach out to your CVBs, tourist boards, DMOs, whatever name we have. But whatever city, whatever country you do business in, I really encourage all of you to reach out to your CVBs. We are your link between what's happening in the hotels, what's happening at the venues. For instance, in Los Angeles, I could tell you, I could stand up here for over an hour, easily with a city like Los Angeles and tell you all about the 8,000 new hotel rooms and the expansion at the convention center. Um, 
but you know, the convention center can tell you that. Your hotel partners can probably tell you that. I want to encourage you all to reach out to your CVVs to talk about other value. Um, for instance, how we can help you understand better the $14 billion that's going into our airport and how that affects all of your travel into Southern California in the future. I also can tell you about the museums and the venues. For instance, this venue, which is known for performing arts, we're sitting in here having a meeting. Much of the venues in Los Angeles are the same way. $3.8 billion for our new Ram Stadium. Trust me, that stadium is not just about sports. We have a 5,000 person amphitheater in there. We have an enormous amount of ballroom space in there. So your CVB is your link, and we should all be working together. So hotel partners in this room, if you ever get a question, reach out to your CVB. And DMCs in this room, reach out to your CVB. And work together, because at the end of the day, the most important partnership is the one we have with our planners. So I'm going to show you a video instead of telling you numbers and figures and all of that. But I encourage you to reach out to me when you're coming to Southern California. Reach out to my partner in crime, Ms. Jennifer Hicks. If you're going to San Diego, call me first, though. Um, <laughs> but we are all in this to make your experience in our destinations better. Our citizens come from more than 140 countries. In fact, we speak more than 224 languages. Our city's diversity and celebration of diversity is our most defining feature. If you think you know LA, you really don't know LA. We're on the bubble of so many exciting things happening, so many changes, specifically downtown. There's new hotels, restaurants, so many things that are happening that you have to come out and check it out for yourself because it's an exciting time. We really have an in-depth knowledge of the city, whether it's knowing the venues, the partners, where to go. We can find you more information for a unique, interesting interactions or just experiences that you might not be able to make on your own. Here you feel innovation, you feel people looking forward, you feel people being front edge of technology, and if you want to be with them, you have to be here. one of the first cities to get 5G, also the first convention center to get 5G. We're talking about something that's so fast, that is so dense, that is so available, that all of a sudden you can start to think of new use cases. The 5G is going to transform everything that we do and everything that happens across society. Tourism, we recognize that groups really want to make an impact in the local community. We can connect you to local groups that can really create meaningful experiences for your attendees. Thank you, Pamela, and thank you, Los Angeles, for being a terrific sponsor to our chapter. There were a few other sponsors that we'd like to recognize today that, that helped uh, to the experience of this event. Uh, one of them was AFR Furniture, so thank you for providing all the stage sets uh, that you're looking at today. Uh, a second was Livewire Coffee for providing the coffee stand out in the lobby that greeted you this afternoon. And finally, to the Cobb Convention and Visitors Bureau, um, at every meeting they, they host um, meeting planners and allow those folks to attend with comp registration. So thank you for always doing that for us, Chris, and Cobb CVB. So 
I have, uh, this, is, this is pretty much my last meeting in front of all of you as president, and I just wanted to say thank you. Uh, thanks for giving me this opportunity and for allowing me to serve as your president this past year. I am particularly honored by the group of people that really did all the, the hard work and, and made all these events possible and generated revenue and provided community service. So I wanna take a moment and just recognize those folks. And I'd ask each of you to come up here just for a brief uh, moment to receive a plaque and uh, for a photo opportunity. So if you could hold your applause to the end, please. I'd like to call up our current board of directors with, starting first with Terry Doherty. Uh, Terry was our past president. Thank you, Terry. Charlene Lopez. Charlene has run our sponsorships and this past year, she set a brand new record for revenue for the chapter. So um, very appreciative of everything she's done. Uh, Chris Colbert, Chris is our incoming president and he has all kinds of great things uh, in store for you for next year. Michelle Lober, Michelle puts together all of these awesome programs for you. She's been our program chair. Mary Klein, Mary's in charge of our membership. Samantha Caribri Star and her, her twin sister who I, they've both relocated to uh, Washington DC so I don't think they're here but also Sarah. Um, Edward Vargo, Edward's in charge of our volunteers. And Cassandra Ruel, or she, uh, Cassandra is in charge of all of our um, community service programs that we do as a chapter. Uh, please mark your calendars for um, the upcoming Southeast, PCMA Southeast events. Um, the next meeting is actually a joint meeting with Georgia MPI, PCMA Southeast, and IAEE. It's probably the community's biggest event, and it's going to be at the Georgia Aquarium on December 10th. Um, now I'd like to welcome up Edward Vargo to speak about our volunteers. Thank you, everyone. This will be brief. Um, I actually thought I was supposed to go after the presentation. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to thank everybody for coming today and to ask you all if you have the time and the patience, um, if, you, if you could volunteer with us. You know, PCMA is built on a group of volunteers. Um, we have a very strong organization as is, but we're always looking for new people to join us and be part of the team and really push PCMA Southeast forward. So if you are able to join and, and willing to join, we would gladly and appreciatively accept your application to be on the volunteer, on one of our volunteer committees. Um, and then I believe we have a slide. I just wanted to take a moment to honor uh, the volunteers for 2019. Um, they've all done a lot of hard work and have been very dedicated to their roles. And uh, we thank them very much. I thank you for your time. And finally, thank you to Brenda Dempsey, who sponsors our volunteer of the quarter for the PCMA Southeast chapter. Um, Brenda. Hi, 
I wish I could say that I sponsor this award, but actually it's Nashville. So. <laughs> and while Kevin was recognizing all the, uh, this past year's board of directors, I think he failed to mention himself. And I can tell you that as a past president of this organization, that is a huge responsibility and huge amount of time. So please join me in a round, uh, warm of applause, round of applause for Kevin. <laughs> because that is definitely a volunteer. Nashville is just so excited to continue in its sponsorship of the Volunteer of the Quarter and Volunteer of the Year for PCMA Southeast Chapter. And uh, it gives me great pleasure to present this award at our quarterly meetings. Um, this uh, quarter's recipient is a member of the Southeast Chapters Community Service uh, Committee. When asked why she volunteers through PCMA, she says that she finds doing volunteer work is not only self-rewarding, but also gives her an opportunity to meet and connect with new possible business contacts. When she says why would she tell other PCMA members to get involved, she says getting involved in a committee or volunteering offers you more than an opportunity to achieve your career goals, but an opportunity to make new friends while helping your community. And I know those of you who are longtime volunteers within this chapter would agree that we all have made many lifelong friends in this organization. So it gives me great pleasure to present this uh, quarterly award to Cheryl Ellers with the Georgia Tech Hotel and Con Conference Center. Is Cheryl here? Congratulations, Cheryl, and thank you, Brenda, and the Nashville CVB for that awesome sponsorship uh, to continue the excitement around volunteering at PCMA. Um, before I bring up, the, bring up uh, David McCauley to talk about the panel, I just want to take a moment to recognize Janae Peltier, who is here from Washington, D.C. Um, she is our board liaison for PCMA National Chapter. So, Janae, if you don't mind standing up, um, just in case anyone has feedback to give her or has comments, you can grab her after the meeting. But thank you for flying down here today to spend the afternoon with us today. So we're, we're extremely excited about this incredible panel of meeting planners that have been assembled. We have some out-of-town guests, but David McCauley is here to uh, speak about all of them and uh, moderate the panel. So David, you're welcome. <laughs> the loo. Okay. Well, that's all right. <laughs> Happens to the best of us. We'll draw this out, Nancy. Looks like you'll get to eat. Don't you? Okay. We'll we'll upstage those other ones. Hey, Susan Harrington. We keep it on point here in the Southeast chapter, huh? I'm gonna sit in my assigned chair so you don't mess around for a second. <laughs> All right, Archer, here we go. Kirsten, I told you it was gonna be a little, I, I said you had a minute to go, go potty, but <laughs> nature calls, happens to the best of us. Archer. I told Akshar I didn't want to give him the Southern. I just met him today, and I said, I'm going to be like the Southern pronunciation of your name. <laughs> Akshar? <laughs> oh. Do you have assigned seats? Yeah, we're think... kind of sitting in order of the pictures, but you know what? We're going to start a little unconventionally anyway. All right. So what does it matter? Here, uh, 
They do it. Yeah, that's all right. Could you do a little side table here and I'll, I'll just pick at it? <laughs> you know I like a martini. Hey. Well, just a, a point of privilege while we're, while right. we're stalling a little bit. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be back here with the Southeast chapter. It's uh, where I started my career almost 30 years ago uh, here in Cobb County. So it's especially nice to be here at, at Cobb Galleria Center uh, where it all began with Chris and, and Marion and Phelps. <laughs> Sorry, Phelps, you lost your, your chair of honor here next to me. That's great. I, I, but uh, hey, even Phelps he 30 years ago was an early mentor of me. He was, he was out here in Cobb County too, so let's, he was the mentor, I was the little child starting in the industry, so. That's right. Let that, let that catch up to you somewhere. But guys, why don't we uh, go ahead and start out with just some introductions. Um, I always like to hear as a supplier myself, not just about your organization, uh, a little biographical information, but uh, tell us a little bit about your meetings portfolio. What's your kind of the size and scope of maybe your largest meeting, but maybe a second or third largest meeting that might be contained in a hotel? And do you do anything here in the Southeast, just out of curiosity? Aksher, why don't we go down the line? Sure. So um, <clears throat> I am uh, representing AHOA. It's the Asian American Hotel Owners Association. Uh, we're the largest hotel owners uh, association in the world pushing about 19,000 members currently. Um, nearly more than about half the hotels in the country are owned uh, by either our members or uh, development companies. Um, we've got a portfolio of roughly about 200 events that we do yearly, um, starting with the Super Bowl, which is our annual convention that sees anywhere between eight to 9,000 people. Um, and then it ranges anywhere between uh, 100 people all the way to 500 people, so we've got about 20 regionals that we do, um, about 100 plus town halls, uh, five to seven educational workshops. And then uh, we also partner with our brand partners or industry partners, what we call to have uh, affiliate meetings at their annual conventions as well. So for example, um, if there's a Best Western Conference or a Marriott Conference going on, because our members, our uh, developers or owners of that brand will have a small affiliate meeting, <coughs> excuse me, at that convention as well. So that way we've not only <coughs> attracted more membership, but we're also giving uh, industry updates right there and then. Awesome, Nancy. Hi, my name is Nancy Tuhill. I'm the director of meetings and events for the Wireless Infrastructure Association. We're based in the um, DC area, but I work remotely from Atlanta. And I'm very happy to be here this afternoon. We have one large annual convention that's about 3,000 attendees. We have two smaller conventions that are in the 500 attendee range. Um, those are mostly in hotels. And then our annual conference alternates between large hotel properties and convention centers. And then we have an awards dinner every fall that's usually contained in a hotel as well. Kirsten, not Kirsten. <clears throat> I'm Kirsten Aline. I'm the director of meetings at the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. I've been there for about two and a half months. Um, and so it's my first foundation experience, and it's, it's very different and really cool. Um, so we have a, the large North American Cystic Fibrosis Conference, which just finished um, Saturday night in Nashville. Um, I only would say yes to this for David McCauley. <laughs> um, so I'm still a little bit brain dead, so hopefully, hopefully I'm going to be able to rally for you all today. But um, So we have the, the, the NACFC, which is about 5,000 people, um, and then we have um, a few smaller conferences that range sort of from the 300 to 650, 700 range, and then just a ton of small stuff. I'm still discovering everything that we do. Um, and getting a, a handle on our portfolio. I believe NACFC has been in Atlanta in the past. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure, you know, I'm sure if David has his way, it'll come back here. Um, <clears throat> but uh, looking forward to being here with you this afternoon. So thanks for having me. I'm, I'm based in uh, the DC area. So thanks for having me here as a, as a guest today. Fantastic, welcome. Thanks, David. Uh, Phelps Hope, and I think I know most everybody in the room, if I haven't met you, let's chat afterwards. I love meeting our folks in the industry. 
Uh, as the senior vice president of meetings and expositions for the Kellen Company, uh, I'm the division head uh, for the folks, the professionals within Kellen who manage all of the meetings and trade shows and symposiums and board meetings and any kind of live event at all for the uh, 100 plus associations that we manage. We are the only global association management company, so we've staffed offices in Beijing and uh, Brussels and offices in Singapore, Mumbai and Bahrain. Uh, we uh, tend to, to have a high international component as we uh, cross-pollinate through the industries that we have. Um, we do about 300 meetings and events and trade shows every year, uh, everything from 25 people up to about 4,000. So we like to say that we've got a program for every property everywhere. Uh, it just depends on where they're heading, where the group is heading, and uh, of course it boils down to rates, dates, and space, right? Uh, well, we can, uh, we, can, we can talk about just about every other program that there is out there. Well, good. Quite uh, a brain trust here. There are kind of five overarching topics that we want to cover today, uh, and I'll run through them real quick if you want to be thinking about them, and if anyone has any questions, you are free to jump in whenever, whether you have a microphone or not, I'll hear you. But uh, they're creating engaging learning environments, uh, sponsorship and the implications of that, uh, integrating health and wellness into your meetings, uh, safety and security, uh, and then we'll land on uh, contracts, which is a little mundane, but always important. Um, Phelps, I think we uh, thought that you might be good to go first talking about creating new and engaging learning environments. And then yeah, the absolutely. others, please be thinking how you might tag on. Thanks, David. Because we have a, a, a huge and varied portfolio of different associations, we start out with two particular points. One is, what's the strategic goals of that particular organization? And that works for whether it's association or corporate or a charity group or what have you. What are they, what are they in business to do and what are they trying to achieve at this particular event? And then the other point is, what's the behavior of the body? What the, the attendees, who are they? What are their buying habits? What are their behavioral habits? Are they younger and more nimble in technology or are they more established? Are they surgeons? Are they plumbers? because it's great to set up an engagement program and you find that they don't use social media, so they're not involved at all. Uh, so we start out from that, so we build our profile. Then we understand, well, how do these people engage? Uh, how do they engage in their daily lives? How do they engage in their work life? Uh, is it a mobile workforce like surgeons? They're not, they don't really have offices, so they're not sitting on the internet and, and, and doing things so to communicate with them. Uh, or the airline industry, for example, dealing with uh, the, uh, the folks who service the airlines, uh, the gate agents and ramp uh, uh, operators and, and the flight attendants and so forth. So we'll understand that first and then uh, we build that into the venue itself. Where are we going and what does the venue offer and then we adapt into that. We find that uh, as a rule, David, that uh, the attendees nowadays want to engage more one-on-one. -on -one. So we set up uh, casual conversation areas with floating topics or we'll put a subject matter expert in them. But again, we'll, we'll utilize what the venue has and, and tuck them in corners and, and redesign the ballroom if we've got a lot of space to, to play with. We'll, we'll get more creative with it if we're in tighter space. We make sure that we're flying people around. But the bottom line is it's that one-on-one -on -one interaction and how do they communicate and how can we perpetuate that communication so that there's more value for those attendees. Kirsten, I recall you did some interesting things when you had a former organization of yours had a meeting in Atlanta, but whether it was there or anywhere else you're doing it. Yeah, and I'll say I'm, I'm so early at um, CFF that we haven't really started, I haven't really started, you know, looking at those pieces for our meeting. Um, but I was previously with the American Society for Microbiology, and we put a lot of emphasis on creative learning environments. Um, it was a very traditional scientific meeting, and the reality is that you're never going to take away their desire to stand in a room and scroll through, you know, a hundred slides in 20 minutes with um, rich, deep data in it that you can't see from the back of the room. Um, you're just not going to take that away from them. It's how they want to present their science. So we sort of took an approach of, well, we're not going to try to take that away or change that, but we're going to supplement it with the types of learning environments that we know are really conducive to people making those connections. Um, and we really had a lot of emphasis on sort of that content-based networking. And so 
Um, we built on our show floor um, what we called um, hubs, track hubs. We had eight programming tracks and we built a hub for every track on the show floor. It was a 40 by 40 footprint, so pretty significant on the floor. And we had lots of shorter um, learning opportunities there, 30 to 40 minutes. Um, intended to be more engaging, not traditional seating, um, not, you know, we used the catch box microphones and to try to keep people engaged. And so we did a lot of programming in there. Um, we also built a lot of learning environments around in the public space. And Atlanta was the first place that we really did that where we called them, um, I think, what did we call them? Lounge and Learns, I think, which I totally stole from another organization. Um, <laughs> but we would do, you know, rapid fire poster talks in there. We would broadcast a lot of sessions into that space and, and we would broadcast the general session to that space. When we were here at the Georgia World Congress Center, we said, hey, you've got a bunch of TV monitors above your bar. Can we commandeer those and broadcast our general session there? And they said, sure. Mm -hmm. So we did that. Um, so just know, kind of understanding that people don't always want to sit in a dark ballroom or sit in a room and absorb content, and they may also be trying to multitask and do other things. Um, and so how can we use the space? And I think one of the things that's really challenging um, is that more and more of us um, on the planner side are really trying to build these learning in, in environments um, in the spaces, and we're trying to do that in a square box. Um, you know, convention centers, hotels, all those rooms are square, rectangle rooms, whatever, but they're not necessarily the furnishings and the space is not necessarily conducive to creating those kind of um, engaging learning environments that we want to create. So I personally think that's a real opportunity for facilities and hotels to really think about how they can help us to create those environments, whether it's partnering with a furniture rental company like we have sponsoring us today or someone like Steelcase or where you can offer some of those creative seating um, opportunities and things like that for a lesser cost or you've got some of that furniture in your own stock or you've thought about how your public space can be used for those creative and learning environments. I mean, when, when we did those lounge and learns in the public space, we had to adapt every city that we went to. And in a city like Atlanta, we were able, there's lots of furniture around the Georgia World Congress Center and we could repurpose that and use that and it saved us a lot of money. And then you go to other convention centers where there's no furniture to be found anywhere in the public space and you're bringing all of that in from your decorating company and that can have a big hit on the budget. So I think facilities that can help to uh, build those creative learning environments, whether it's a standard part of your facility or something that you can help your um, your clients and your meetings that come in with, I think those facilities can really set themselves apart mm -hmm. um, to help us create those environments because some of us have more money than others um, to spend on those types of things, but we really want to be creating those environments for our attendees to make those connections and to be able to, to learn in an environment that is you know, aligned with um, adult learning principles. Yeah, and I, just to expand upon that slightly, we've got a similar, um, you know, similar issue that our breakout sessions are can get highly technical, and they'll have you know a multitude of PowerPoint slides, and people just fall asleep during that. You know, and our attendees are very fickle; they will leave the room if they're not engaged. And so it's a balance of getting the important information across to the attendees so that they feel like they're learning during the conference and entertaining them and providing them with unique experiences. So we discourage PowerPoint as much as possible. We encourage video. We encourage kind of hands-on opportunities. Um, we have some areas in our exhibit hall similar to what Kirsten was saying, where we you know, have lightning talks or hands-on demos and things like that, just to take the learning out of the classroom setting and, and make it more practical for attendees. Mm -hmm. Do you want anything to add? Yeah, so I, would, I wanted to ask the audience, actually, by show of hands, how many of the audience members are either on the venue sales side or just sales side in general? Oxford, you're taking my job here. <laughs> Sorry, I don't want your I'll job, I'll actually. <laughs> I do not want your job. What I wanted to say is um, when you get an RFP or, or a request for anything, it's always the tendency of the salesperson to say, you know, we've got this great ballroom, we've got this, you know, contiguous space of X amount of square feet. And that's what you want to show off, right? That's its natural habit. But as uh, my fellow peers have said, it's all about also that small group of intimacy that you can bring to your meetings and, and events. Um, 
that I, I currently see, at least in our program, has a lot of ROI on it, both on the sponsorship side, but also on the engagement side. Because you, know, you can set a, a ballroom theater style, classroom style, whatever it is, there's really nothing special about it. Or you know, you've got the either rear projection situation or the fancy LEDs. But um, if you can showcase off what you can do with small groups, breakouts, et cetera, that's going to set yourself apart um, from a venue standpoint, a sales standpoint, but it also gives you know people like us the opportunity to construct a program in different ways. Um, to give a little bit more insight is when we're looking at sites or conventions year out, because our organization is a trade organization, the economic landscape plays a huge role. Um, currently, the hotel market or the hospitality market in general is strong. It's thriving. It's uh, the I think the, the contribution of the meetings and events industry is roughly in the $13, $14 billion you know, arena at the moment. There's only, I think, 15 or so other countries that have a GDP of that much financial resource. So when you look at that, we're at a, we're at a peak right now. But at that peak, there's probably going to be some slippage, or um, I don't want to say it, but there may be even more than slippage. So how do venues, how do meeting planners prepare for that whole uh, slippage to happen, and that's when something like the meetings may reduce in either size or in attendees, um, but then planning ahead with that, this type of intimate breakout um, sizes will definitely help uh, venues as well as us uh, be in business at the end of the day. Yeah. And how, when you're talking about creating engaging learning environments, I think a lot of us look to convening leaders, you know, the PCMA annual meeting, and, and they've done, I always think, a, a great yeah. job. Mm -hmm. job. Have any of you, do you have any examples of where you saw something at convening leaders or any of the other industry organizations and thought, well, yeah, they did it for free for them, <laughs> but were you able to successfully uh, replicate it at, at your own events? Our, actually, our learning lounges that we did at ASM, for, for me, were directly inspired from convening leaders, but from actually something they didn't have. So um, I was giving a talk at convening leaders in Austin, and um, of course, I was talking in like two hours, and I hadn't finished my slides, because I'm that speaker that we all hate. Um, <laughs> and so the general session was, ha there was a general session happening, and I wanted to go to that session, but I also needed to work on my slides. And that, the general session was, you know, big ballroom set in theater. And so I went up to one of the staff, and I said, are we, are we live streaming this out anywhere else? Because you know, they have all these overflow spaces that they do really cool. You can get on a treadmill and do yeah. overflow. You can sit on a couch. You can do all these things. And there were all these overflow spaces, but they actually weren't broadcasting or overflowing the general session. And so I had to make a choice. Do I, do I go someplace and work on my slides, or do I go to the general session? And if there had been a place where it was overflowing, I could have done both. And, and it was a really just sort of this aha moment for me of recognizing that people at your meeting are trying to do multiple things. They still have families at home. They still have jobs at home, but they're trying to be there and they're trying to take care of their obligations back home. And so that was what inspired me to say, how can I get our general sessions everywhere so that people have a choice of how they consume that content? Um, and so Dan took a lot of a page from PC Man what those spaces looked like, but just use them even more broadly um, to make sure that the mm -hmm. general session was out there as well as some of the other smaller sessions that were overflowed. Cool. Yeah, and we, uh, we got a lot of great ideas out of convening leaders as well. Um, it's great because they've got bigger budgets than most of our meetings, so I can see what is possible and then bring it back into the reality of what we're trying to do. Uh, one of the ones that, that carried forward for me was to break up the exhibit hall, you know, even the tabletops, you know, especially the younger generation, they're not really wanting to walk down rows and rows of eight by tens or ten by ten booths and, and have the salesperson trying to grab them and pull them into the booth. And if they do come into your booth, they want something to interact with. You know, if you're just going to tell me information, I, I can go to your website or I can, I can get information, but show me the relevance and teach it to me. So what I saw at uh, PCMA, and uh, I think it was in Vancouver, and it was the, uh, the, the tech village, the tech central kind of concept, where it was little small bites of technology, mm -hmm. and you come and play for a little while. You know, the, uh, the, the salespeople are there as advisors, but they were really low key. They weren't pushing 
so you didn't feel like you're getting locked into lengthy, long conversations and having to repeat. They just you just got a chance to touch on it and then follow up later on, which was a, a unique experience. We've carried that through on a number of our conferences, including our own corporate meeting, um, so that we can display technology in an interactive environment that's in small bites. So then you as the attendee get to make up your mind what the application might be for you, and if you think there's a possibility, providing that uh, opportunity for follow-up later on. And uh, that was a different experience for us, and having personally felt it, I was able to build on that on many of the conferences that we're doing. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. I think Vancouver was particularly impactful from a util space utilization mm -hmm. perspective. Um, they did a great job with sessions in the foyer. And, you know, when I first walked up to them, I thought, oh, people are going to be distracted because there's all, these, all this beautiful scenery around. But you know, they kept everybody engaged. And, you know, we ended up partnering with a vendor from that little tech mm -hmm. village. Because, again, you know, you're walking by, you see something, catches your eye, and, you know, Four years later, we're still working with them. So I think that they did a really great job utilizing the space at that convention center. Yeah, I st actually stole an idea from uh, HFTP show um, in Houston, I think two years ago. They had the boneyard section, or they had you know one section that was just kind of free space. But they realized that in the tech side, but also, I mean, uh, this could be a, a common denominator. There are certain companies that want to be part of a larger show, but just may not have the financial resources. So they took that space and said, you know what, we're going to put 50 high tops there. We're going to cut our 10 by 10 uh, rate from 5,000 to anywhere between 750 to $1,000 per tabletop. What that opened up for them was they had dead space. They were, they were already paying for it, but it opened up opportunities for startups or uh, maybe a smaller size company mm -hmm. to exhibit or be part of the show because we all know that with the 10 by 10 booth, it not only has the rate, but it brings the internet, the electricity, right. the freight, and all that other <clears throat> stuff. And easily you're at a five digit uh, number with either staff, resources, lodging, etc. So this boneyard or this open space create a lot of opportunities but also creates more retention so that that tabletop then may say you know what i got 50 leads out of it maybe i'll you know i'll, I'll go to two tabletops or maybe I'll eventually go to a full 10 by 10. Um, but that helps with as i mentioned the space that uh, sales teams and them show but on our side it creates more opportunities at the end of the day that's kind of a good segue into uh, topic number two, which is generally about sponsorship. Um, for most organizations, I imagine after registration, sponsorship might be your second or third biggest revenue stream. Nancy, I think you said it was your first biggest revenue it stream. Is. Yes. So uh, why don't you kick it off there and, and think about sponsorship. I, are there ways uh, some folks in our audience, right, facilities, yep. venues, service providers might help enhance anything, whether that's part of yeah. yeah, so David's right. Sponsorship is the biggest revenue stream um, for our annual conference, and we're constantly working on innovative ways to keep sponsors engaged, to bring them back, um, to allow them to show off their brands. Um, but we also try to strike a balance of, you know, not having NASCAR logos ev slapped mm -hmm. everywhere. Um, so we try to come up with innovative sponsorship ideas that enable companies to, you know, really accomplish what they're trying to do at our event. And flexibility, to me, um, for us and on behalf of the venue, I think is the name of the game. So coming, working with us to find creative ways where a company can put a brand, put a cling, um, you know, put some branded furniture, for example. Um, we've got a company right now who would like to drop off pillows in each of the hotel rooms at, um, at the hotels for our annual convention, which is great. Um, but now th the hotels see that, you know, they have dollar signs in their eyes, unfortunately, and they want to charge an upcharge because a pillow is a larger item than a gift bag. So I think, you know, we, so we push back and we rely on the venues to really be flexible with us on pricing to make things like creative sponsorships like putting pillows on the beds in hotel rooms to make them, you know, less cost prohibitive to, um, you know, so we, we partner with them in order to do that. Um, and we've been successful in some places and haven't been successful flexibility wise in others, but um, it's extremely important to our organization. 
Phelps, anything? You've got a broad portfolio. Of yeah, we sure do. And uh, depending on the organization, uh, and some of our clients are corporate, and so they, they do look for ways to help uh, display some of the uh, divisional branding or the, the sub-corporate uh, messaging uh, to, the, to the audience as well. So it works in the corporate sector too, even though it may not be monetizing, it's certainly about message delivery. In the, uh, in the beginning of the sales process, uh, as, a, as a hotel or a venue salesperson, understanding what you can do in your own facility as far as can I attach clings to the air walls here? Can I put them on the carpet? Can I, can I uh, do your banisters on the, on the escalator? And, and in the sales process, having an understanding of what your venue can do to become a, an asset for the sponsor sales folks in our organization then that just ups the ante that w there's a potential for us to be making more sponsorship money if we're coming to your venue. Uh, to flip it around, there's some facilities that are extremely restrictive and you can't do this and you can't do that and you can't do that and it, it reaches a point that we just, it doesn't make it viable that yep. you're not really a partner, you just want to sell us right. catering, Take meeting space cut. and hotel rooms mm -hmm. and not really interested in the goals of the meeting, we're trying to make us achieve, <coughs> help us achieve what our goals are. To that, it goes back to the first comment I made uh, at the beginning of the segment here, that understanding the strategic goals of the organization, well, the organization that's booking it, but also the sponsorship group that's a part of that organization, you know, who are they? Are they a whole collection of mum and pops, so you need little $250 and $300 level sponsorship availabilities? Or are they big corporate entities that, that are quite happy writing a check for $15,000, $20,000, $30,000? Uh, some facilities want to charge you as much for the floor clean as I might be able to get as a sponsor item, so now it's no longer a viable opportunity. Uh, or it's going to cost me more than I could potentially get, get, get revenue mm -hmm. for it. So it's, you kind of price yourself, I call it the old baggage fees, and you know, they just, just keep adding fees and adding costs because, yes, I get it from a venue standpoint, but understanding who the client coming in and do you have flexibility to say, you know what, we can probably give you a few of those yeah. or you know what, we can, we can cut it to make it price uh, you know, within your marketplace and then it, it is no longer a barrier to us booking the facility yeah. mm -hmm. or really having a great experience in the facility because you know, especially for association work, you're probably going to get a repetitive booking out of it if it's a huge success. Mm -hmm. If we made money as an organization, if we were able to boost attendance and boost sponsorship and, and, and all the success factors metrics that we're meeting, if your venue was a key part of that, well, guess what? You're top of the list for the next time yeah. we're going to rotate through. So th there's a, a longer term as well as the short term booking um, uh, benefit uh, by understanding who the group is that you're coming in. Uh, to, that's coming in to look at your facility. And this is a very little bit of homework, carries a lot of weight. So if you've already looked at the website of the association and looked at their annual meeting or the series of meetings that they're looking to come in, and you see the sponsor perspective or the exhibitor perspective, yeah. you can see what the pricing is, you can see what their offerings are. Oh, I see that you like to put clings on the windows. We can put them over here, over here, over here. Yeah. And already you're a part of the conversation, and I'm not having to explain the first time we meet who we are. A little bit of homework goes a long, long way. Yeah, I agree with that. Akshar, I would think your organization would have a lot of sponsorship opportunities, am I? No, you're right. Uh, a couple of years ago, I did an exercise where I took the day in the life of an attendee and mm -hmm. walked that, that city or, or, or that venue. And to me, it was, where am I gonna be uh, the most during this period of time, that period, period of time, and at night? So I'm saying this publicly, you guys are all gonna laugh. My members love to drink, not water. <laughs> um, and they like the good stuff. Mine too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they like the good stuff, the Johnny Walker Blacks and so forth. So what we took that was, we, we, we took that to say those are sponsorship opportunities. So I think Jennifer Hicks from San Diego, she's in the room somewhere. Mm -hmm. So last year when we were in uh, San Diego, we rented out the gas lamp district. And there's a company out there that um, does a block party type situation. So we contracted a block party, and then I think it was eight to nine venues that, we, that was in our contract. We took each venue and sold it as sponsorship. So each brand or each company would then have the opportunity to go in, brand the place how they wanted, food and beverage all out the door, et cetera. But we found there was more ROI in that rather than providing uh, 
standard buffet dinner at the convention center and then standard entertainment. So that opened doors for us to say the, the companies had you know, full attention of people one on one. The attendees had a good memorable experience. Um, so we, we, we're looking at non-traditional sponsorships as well. So even in the hotels um, at the Grand Hyatt in 2017, that small lobby bar in San Antonio, if some of you know that place, we generated $120,000 in just bar revenue over two and a half days. And uh, the, the, the general manager said, you know, I don't know if these numbers are true. And I'm like, no, they're true. Yeah. Trust <laughs> it. They're true. Uh, and he's like, well, I've never seen this, this type of number come through. And I said, well, you know, I'm bringing this business to you, but it, it opened more sponsorship yeah. opportunities for things outside the convention center. And I think if you, if you go to your sponsors or your exhibitors or your financial stakeholders, et cetera, and actually paint this picture, um, they're going to be more acceptive of doing that. I know Kevin's in the back of the room, but him and I always exchange ideas, even on the trade show floor. Our f Kevin, you can speak this, but I think our floor has grown at least 5% annually, would you say, in the last four years? So even better. So I'll, t I'll let him take the credit for that. <laughs> uh, but we went from 100 and uh, I think 80,000 square feet in 2016. And I can't look at a convention center now less than 300,000 square feet of a continuous space. Awesome. But what that did, it creates sponsorship, it creates retention. So I would strongly suggest on the venue side or even on our side, look outside of your traditional sponsorships. Yes, an elevator wrap looks <laughs> great, but the elevator mm -hmm. wrap is only going to be seen maybe twice, thrice, under what circumstances, yeah. at 2 in the morning or at 7 in the morning, whatever <laughs> that looks like. Uh, but you, everyone in the room should always start thinking outside the box to make sure that the financial uh, stability but also the retention is there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, I love that. And I, you know, as a lot of us that are destination <laughs> representatives in the room, we always want to get people to engage in our cities. So, and I know my colleagues and I are always trying to get people to do creative things outside of the convention center. But in your San Diego example, did you take the financial risk? And most people say no, and they decline the opportunity. Oh, no, we couldn't take the financial risk and, yeah. and guarantee all the food and beverage minimums at those eight restaurants. But. Yeah, we took the risk. I mean, um, we still paid a little bit out of pocket, but it was enough to cover the essential cost of what I would have been doing traditionally at the convention center. So um, it was a big, big risk. Uh, my, my CEO, he's moved on, but him and I went to battle a lot uh, in the sense of, do we do this? Do we not do this? Um, when him and I agreed to do this, we've, we have four other officers on board that we got to bring them on board. So they're looking at the numbers like, oh, no. I mean, uh, love San Diego, but as everyone knows, it's a pretty expensive city. So when you look at the numbers and crunch all that together and you've got to pre present a, a budget, they're like, oh, no, this is not going to happen. On top of that, I threw in Petco Park, which is not a e <laughs> cheap ticket either. <laughs> so they were kind of, uh, they were they were not happy when they first saw the numbers, but we took that risk, and uh, I won't go back and, and make a, another decision. And, and we came out uh, on the positive rather than wow. the negative, for sure. That's great. I just want to say I'm certain you could do something like that at LA Live. <laughs> 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 Pam, where are you? Sorry. <laughs> David, if I can add to that, Akshal brings up a great point. As he was identifying uh, a behavior of his audience with the, uh, with the bar tab, if you will, so he's able to frame that out and then communicate it forward as he's looking at venues and, and help replan it. Uh, we have a couple of organizations that are now having some organic meetups, as that's our language for them, that after we're done with nine o'clock at the reception, they start tweeting, twittering, <laughs> Facebooking, face chatting, whatever. You're so young, folks. Right. <laughs> yeah. I can't keep up with it. And before you know it, we've got two or 300 attendees converging on a bar or a restaurant outside of the venues on a Monday night. And there's not a restaurant in town that's staffed up on a Monday night for an extra two or 300 people. And, uh, but we're noticing this kind of organic trend. And so uh, for one organization, we, uh, we, we identified it and we were able to get ahead of it and work with our bureau partner to bring in a couple of the restaurant owners and so forth. And we, we put together, uh, there was no risk to the association. It was just a matter of alerting the restaurant and gearing them, steering them over to that way. Well, the, in the first year it was so successful, it now becomes a sponsor item that 
that uh, the, the, the sponsor steps in and with a branding, they underwrite you know, some late night hors d'oeuvres or dessert or a specialty cocktail or so forth. And it just enhanced the experience, but now there's a sponsorship opportunity has opened up into the organization that just didn't exist. So it's about paying attention to, okay, we always have the gold package sponsorship and we just resell it every year. Well, is that really satisfying the sponsorship community, what their needs are, and is it really providing the, uh, the interactivity that the audience body is now looking for. So as, a, as an organization leader, but also it works with the venues. Hey, this is what we've seen with other organizations. We've right. seen other meetings come through and this was successful. So it's that, that partner's not just with the sponsorship concept of how can we open up new sponsorship assets within your organization, your venue or your city, but it also is how do we make the experience more enriching and that's the other part of engagement that we talked about originally that attendees are looking for. I want to go home with an experience. Mm -hmm. You know, what is something new and different mm -hmm. that, that we haven't done before? And that is not age specific. That's, right. uh, that's, that's just the way it is now. Yeah. I would agree with that. I think that um, sponsors, sponsors now are looking for the less traditional. I mean, do you still want to do elevator clings and floor clings and things like that, digital signage, but they're looking for more creative ways to get their brand out. Um, we had, a, when I was at the ASMA meeting in um, West Palm Beach, and um, we were working with them. We actually were, were struggling with one thing we were trying to do with sponsorship. So I went to the bureau and I said, can you just help us figure this piece out? And they said, well, while we're at that, let, can we talk to you about some other interesting things you can do in our city that we can help make happen for you? And one of the things they have is these little cars, carts, electric car, mm -hmm. carts, oh, like, yeah. you know, like, oh, and you can brand them. Yeah. And we sold those to one of our sponsors, and it was taking people back and forth from the Marriott to the to the uh, convention center and down down to the restaurants. And I stayed for like three days after the meeting to take a little R and R because you know it's West Palm Beach, <laughs> and um, I saw that those little cars and that sponsorship everywhere. Yeah. So like mm -hmm. not only were they getting exposure to our attendees and providing this great service so people didn't have to walk, but they also were basically like their brand was out in the city for the entire time that they were there. It was like a pharma company. And so it was just, they were like, look, we can help you think of some other creative things. Here's one of the services we provide as a bureau that you can now brand and you can make money off of. And that was a really, and the sponsor loved it because it was non-traditional and it really exposed them more than just when people are in the convention center. But how about, and to kind of close out this topic of sponsorship, I'm curious for you, Kirsten, to talk about how the pharmaceutical, medical device, regulations impact mm -hmm. sponsorship for medical groups. I mean, sometimes yeah, we have I mean, false I think it's definitely, it's required us to become more creative over time because they are very restrictive. And I was, um, and now that I'm with the, a foundation, we actually have our own compliance department within the foundation, and we're even more restrictive. Um, than the than the the you know all the other medical restrictions that are out there, and so we actually do. We don't have a lot of opportunity to. We have to get really creative with sponsorship, you know. So like we can't put inserts in the bags, but so we have we give we have little bags that people can get with the inserts when they come into the exhibit hall. Um, and the, but the flip side of that is so so we we have less opportunity for sponsorship. Our goal also as a foundation is not necessarily to m make money on the meeting. Our goal is to bring together the right people that are going to cure cystic fibrosis. So it does a little bit of a different perspective. Um, but the flip side of that is that we then want to brand the building with our own brand um, because we still want to have that branding. So we were just in Nashville, it was my first meeting, and I was walking around the building saying, we own this building, but it doesn't feel like we own this building mm -hmm. because there's nothing on the outside that says we're here. There's nothing, you know, and, and I wasn't involved in all the decisions um, that were made about sponsorship, but that can be expensive too to do it just for our branding. And so understanding that there are some groups that don't have the sponsorship opportunities, but still want to be a presence in your building or in your city or in your facility, and how can you work with us? Yeah. And so Nashville has a lot of great digital signage, and we were able to work with them on a really affordable and reasonable package that enabled us to do some very impactful branding using their digital space. Um, that you know would have really it, it did really enhance the 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 feeling that we were in this building, um, but like the you know it's not always about how can we, you know as you were saying like nickel and diming and how we can always sell and and how much money you can make off it, but sometimes understanding that we also want to be a presence and a brand in the meeting, 
um, and how, you know, how can we do that and how can you work with us to do something that's reasonable for both parties but enables us to achieve that objective. Yep. Cool. Let's move on to topic number three and that's uh, integrating health and wellness into your meetings. Um, maybe that also touches a little upon sustainability, um, you know, the compostable utensils and we're not gonna have pipe and drape anymore, we're gonna have kale curtains and bamboo <laughs> rods. But, uh, and, and Akshar, I think when we had our call, you were mentioning, yeah, we'd love to do it. You also maybe tied that into tossing it off to a sponsor, so kind of that segue from sponsorship into health and wellness. Yeah, um, so on our call, we we talked about this, and at least for our um, annual convention, when you've got about 8,000 people at your doorstep, um, it's it's hard to please everyone, nor is it um, easy to even please a group of 100 or 200. So. Um, I like to take advantage of the, of the hotels or even some of the local DMCs. For example, Weston has this program that they'll um, arrange for a run, I think every other day or th maybe it's every day. A staff person takes a group out at six mm -hmm. in the morning, takes you in the local trails, et cetera, and then provides that program. So um, while I'm definitely for um, health and wellness, sometimes it just doesn't fit in my planning cycle just because it, it's a small piece of it. So I like to partner up with the hotels and those types of groups to kind of, you know, one branch off, but also give the hotel an opportunity to um, showcase their programs. Um, the second piece of that is that uh, what you just mentioned about the kale curtains and the, and the bamboo <laughs> by, uh, rods. Um, we've moved away from using China silver glass in our um, whole convention for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, it helps me um, negotiate better on the food and beverage side. Uh, having an executive steward background, I definitely know what it takes to put together that much china silver glass. But when I said to the, the, the convention center, I was like, hey, look, you guys are LEED certified. You know you need to meet a certain threshold of doing this much disposable items, et cetera. I'll help you with that with 40,000 covers for three or four days. You guys make your quota. I save some cash on my end. Wow but it's a win-win situation. So bringing the sustainability on that side. And then the third part of this uh, that we talked about was make your trade show or make your just event fun, right? Um, everyone at your event is either putting on miles on their feet, whether it's trade show or a standalone program, do something like a pedometer challenge. It, it's as simple as that. Everyone is either hooked to a Fitbit or some type of smart device um, and create that engaging program where um, attendees can you know, participate against each other. I know there's Fitbit challenges or those types of programs out there. You can challenge yourself, but it also drives people to um, the booths as well. So for lead retrievals, um, even if you, know, you don't make a deal, but you can get 50 to 70 leads at, at any given point with just foot traffic. These are all different <coughs> creative ways that um, can generate the health and wellness piece of it, but in the end, it gives an attendee experience it also gives uh, a sponsorship experience. I know everything's kind of coming back to dollars and cents, but overall, um, I think the four of us would agree that it's all about the experience and how you traditionally think outside the box um, and bringing health and wellness. And every group's different. Um, you know, with the life sciences, they may have a little bit more uh, stronger initiative on doing things like that, and I'm sure that um, they, they push for that. But in general, um, you know, everyone's on their feet. Uh, yeah. I can't imagine how many pairs of shoes we all go through. I just bought a few <laughs> pair of shoes and they're great, but at some point um, we're all putting a lot of miles on our feet, so how, how do you make that into an experience? Yeah. Let's just go down the row there, Nancy. Yeah, you know. well, much like your attendees, our attendees are big drinkers. Um, so we, we struggle with the health and wellness part and you know we struggle with morning activities. We moved our general session back to 10 a.m. instead of 8 a.m. because we noticed wow. that people had a hard time, you know, getting up and moving in the morning. It's, you know, it's just being honest. Um, so we had a sponsor. To do a drink off. <laughs> right, exactly. Power yeah. hour at 8 a.m. Got my attention. <laughs> so we had a sponsor last year at our annual convention ask if they could host a yoga class at 7.30 in the morning. And we said, sure, by all means. Um, here's a room, you know, or you can use this pool deck, I think is where they ended up doing it. And I, they were very disappointed in the number of attendees that were there. Um, out of 2,500 attendees, I think they had maybe 50 for their yoga class. Um, so, you know, it's, 
it's not something that our attendees are necessarily seeking out, um, but we will continue to try to offer them creative, um, creative ways to implement health and wellness and sustainability. Um, but it, at times it backfires on us as well. We had a small meeting a couple years ago and we tried to have pitchers of water and glasses for people and uh, instead of bottled water. And you know, you would have thought that, um, you know, we turned the heat to 100 degrees. Yeah, I mean, it was just, there was a, you know, it was a, a revolt, so we had to go buy water. Um, so, you know, sometimes best laid plans. Um, in that regard, do not do not always work out. Well, Kirsten, when an organization is all about health and wellness in the medical world. Yeah, and it's interesting. At CFF, we're not currently doing any health and wellness, but it's certainly something that I'm looking to integrate. And I think it's really about when we think about people's experience at a meeting, we have to think of them as a whole person. And I think to my example of earlier of like, I need to do work, but I also want to watch the general session. So it's thinking about our attendees as people and not just as like participants that paid a registration fee to participate in the events is, you know, these are people who maybe they typically do, you know, have an exercise routine at home or they have to connect with their family at some point or they need to connect with work at some point and making sure that we're creating an environment in which they can continue to do those things that are important to them whether that's you know an exercise class in the morning one of the things we found to be most su successful when I was at ASM was the like running tours that were mm -hmm. sort of a tour of the mm -hmm. city and running and we would get 40 or 50 people at 6:30 in the morning to do that but now docs wake up early Right, so you know you can do health and wellness at a medical conference probably a little easier than some other. I'm not saying why people don't drink and party too because they do, but they also are tr traditionally pretty early risers and they're willing to get up and 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 do those activities. Um, but then thinking, you know, about the environment that you've created throughout the day to make sure you're giving them the space and the time to be able to make those phone calls or connect back to their family or all of those pieces. If I can just put my PCMA board hat on too and just do a little plug for the way PCMA does it, if you've been to Convening Leaders or to Educon, you know that that is a foundation space, right? So the PCMA Foundation does um, a run, usually a 5K walk run, or maybe it's not 5K, I don't know. I, I don't usually do that one. Um, it is a 5K. <laughs> I do the 1K. I'm not yeah. a runner. No, it's 5K. Um, it's a 5K, yeah. and then they do also a yoga class. It's like Namaste with PCMA, and um, they, you know, then you can... Um, you can get up and participate in those and you pay a fee to do that and it goes to the foundation and there's also a sponsorship opportunity. So somebody is usually, you know, giving out water with their name or water bottles or something that, that are, they're sponsoring that event as well and it's a, it's a charitable um, contribution to the foundation. So that's another way if your organization has a foundation or has something that they want to raise money maybe for a local charity, you can kind of combine that sustainability and yeah. giving back um, with the wellness um, and that can be a really effective way to do that. Yeah. I think PCMA has done that really well at their meetings and they get, you know, and look, if you've been to PCMA, you know people party there too. Um, I always say it's a marathon, not a sprint, um, but people are getting up in big numbers, getting yeah. up and participating in those 5Ks and those yoga yeah. classes in the morning um, and it's raising money for the foundation, so. it's a good point. Yeah, I, I agree. And yeah, you know, we take a look at health and wellness that it's it's not just one aspect, but it's the entire experience of the convention. So, uh, you know, bringing in the, the food and beverage, bringing in the room design, bringing in the activities, every every touch point during the conference or convention, how is it how is it having a positive effect or providing an opportunity for health and wellness? Health and wellness is giving me some time to be able to check emails or call home. Mm -hmm. uh, it's an area to. To, to get my work done but still have the overflow uh, of the general session so I can still participate but I've got to do something else. So it's blending the, the purpose of the, the conference with the work life or the personal life of what you need to do so that it's not an either or and it's mm -hmm. not a black and white and it's not an in or out, it's blended in. And to that point, uh, understanding once again the behavior of your, your audience body uh, the 5K runners, for the most part, are going to find a way to get continue their fitness because you know you, that's not something. Oh, I'm going to start a fitness program and join in on the 5K run. <laughs> it, it's not typically what we do. So having those aspects to it, but also uh, for the longer uh, sessions, the, the the bigger general sessions, 
bringing your speaker base into it. So to that point, everybody, up, please. Up, up, oh, up, God, up, do up, I gotta up, get up, Phelps? Up, up, let's go up, 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 oh. up, up, up. We've all been sitting for 40 to 45 minutes, so now it's oh, a surprise right. a good idea. stretch break. So everybody, arms up, <laughs> all back, <laughs> all That's to the right, <laughs> and <laughs> to the left. And back up. Well done. <laughs> and so just a quick little spontaneous break. What it did, a couple of things. It kind of got your body moving again. That's part of the health and wellness, which is great. But it woke up everybody in the back of the room that's been sleeping yeah. up until this point. Because you can't be the only one sitting when the whole room stands up and does their surprise break. So understanding the audience yeah. and weaving it through in every aspect of your planning. And again, our venue partners, what have you seen? What's worked well? What's some other new thing that you went, wow, that was really cool. Maybe you can add that in. Yeah. So being yeah. aware of your, your book of business, if you will, which is everybody else's conference that comes through your facility, the little anecdotes of things you've seen that have gone well. Don't just sell us the program, send us the contract, and move on to the next thing. Be a partner, invest yourself into the success of the conference. One other thing related to health and wellness that just came up at my conference last week was you know, people's dietary restrictions, which I know make us all crazy because there's a million of them, and some of them are medically necessary, and some of them are not. But we had a, a day with box lunches, and the gluten-free option was a green salad like with no protein, it was green salad and a dressing. And someone came up to me and, and saw my staff badge and decided to you know, really lay into me about it. And she was nice but angry. Um, but but it, was a really, it, it really was sort of an eye-opening moment for me. And she said, like, this is my only opportunity to eat today, right? I've signed up for this event. I've, got, I've gotten a buck lunch. And this is all I've gotten. And I'm going to be starving in a half an hour. And, you know, gluten, like she was gluten-free, I think, and she was like, gluten-free is, for me, a medical condition, mm -hmm. right? And some of us are also diabetic, and we need, so it was just this really, like, really made me think, like, we need to be better about having conversations with our facilities to say, what are you doing about dietary restrictions? What are you offering? And really understanding what those meals are so that we, we are sure that those people that have dietary restrictions are still having a fulfilling food and beverage it, it, uh, experience yeah. and also just making sure they're getting what they need for their, their own health and wellness. And we sort of, I think it's something we just defer to the facilities. We've got X number of vegan, we've got X number of vegan, and we just assume they'll go and take care of it. But there really is this ex yeah. expectation now that you are going to provide a meal mm -hmm. that is equivalent to the experience that someone is having who has not made that dietary restriction, I think is a really important point for facilities. And I think it's something we as planners need to take more responsibility for and really ask those questions and make sure that those, those experiences yeah. are going to be good for those people because to them, it's you know sometimes a matter of life and death, and for the, or or it's a matter from a, another piece of that puzzle of like their holistic you know experience at the meeting. That's a great point. Thank you, Phelps. I'm canceling my four o'clock orange theory. <laughs> <laughs> you just saved me fifty bucks. <laughs> All right, topic number four uh, that we could spend a whole day on is uh, safety and security. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we think of the the big issues, hurricanes and natural disasters or other more ominous things, but uh, kind of bring it to a practical sense. What are implications, <laughs> safety and security that are impacting uh, your meetings? And Kirsten, I think when we talked, you mentioned you wrote the first <laughs> emergency plan for... Yes, when I got to um, CFF, I discovered that they didn't have a crisis management plan, had never had a crisis management plan. Um, and that alarmed me for a meeting of 5,000 people. Um, and so we put together one for our meeting this year, which you know our risk management people were very happy about. Um, but just, and we didn't, you know, thankfully have any major incidents, but we had a couple of medical issues during the meeting. And, you know, what I, re what I noticed is that, like, my team, of course, was one of the ones who were dealing with that. They knew exactly what to do. They knew the protocol. They knew they needed to, you know, let me know. They knew they needed to get an incident report. Like, there was no question about what needed to be done in that kind of situation. And our crisis management plan generally has you know, information about, you know, where we meet in an evacuation, what kind of documents we should have, 
available in hard copy. You know, if we can't get uh, get can't get access to the internet or to our computers, um, you know, who who's responsible? Who are who's the crisis response team? Who's the you know um, going to handle things that we have? We divide our crises into level one, level two. Level one is going to mostly be dealt with my team. Level two has to get escalated to crisis management. Who speaks to the press? Who is responsible for speaking on top, track of the office? Who's making decisions about whether or not we cancel the meeting? Those types of things. And understanding what the facility's responses are. Because we can plan for all the big things, but the reality is if there's something really, really big, your facility, for the most part, is going to be managing that crisis right. and your local emergency responders. But making sure that the staff knew what the what the how to handle all those level ones what's the protocol who do you need to tell who do you call do you call 911 do you call the facility you know do we have EMTs in the building all of those pieces it's just a matter of making sure that people know how to respond who to who to loop in you know I mean we actually had a really interesting conversation with our security company at our meeting because they said well we're not going to give you a copy of our incident report we said well we need to have a copy of the incident report and and helping them to understand that our obligation to the person who is, for lack of a better word, victim in that situation, if we had a medical emergency and we had to send someone to the, to, and put them in an ambulance, well, the security people put them in the ambulance and they're done, mm -hmm. right? Right up the incident report, that person is gone. Well, our policy is that we send a staff person, not a meeting staff person because we don't have time, but someone, <laughs> I mean, there's always 200 other staff there, right? We send a staff person to be with that person at the hospital. We make sure that their family's been contacted. If they need to extend their reservation at the hotel, do they need any special accommodations when they come back to the hotel? Do we need to get them a flight home? We, we want to take care of that person until they are finished with whatever crisis they're in and are, are back home again. And that's not the responsibility of the security company. And if we don't have the information we need right. to be able to do that, we can't do that. So having those conversations with your security partners in your facilities and helping them understand how you approach a crisis and how you take care of your attendees, which is different from how they handle an event in their facility. For those, I think, smaller everyday incidents that are maybe not life or death, mm -hmm. but they are um, something that's happening to your attendee and need to be addressed. We'll kind of open it up randomly, whoever jump in. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll, I can speak to this a little bit. We almost always defer to the facility, um, but I make sure during pre-con and just in you know pre-conference conversations with the facility that they know that all incident reports come to me and you know all phone calls come to me no matter what time it is. Um, you know, call 911 first, call me second. Um, because I need to know what's going on with our attendees for the same reason that Kirsten was saying, you know, do I need to speak with the family? Do I need to um, you know, check in on the attendees? We had somebody that had chest pains during our conference a couple of years ago and had to go to the hospital and the hotel did the exact right thing. They called the ambulance and then they let me know so that I could follow up with the person. He ended up being fine. Um, but you know, I need to know these things because you know, we are, you know, we feel a level of responsibility for attendees. So it's extremely important that venues communicate with planners and that we communicate with the venues right. to let them know who who they contact. I mean, the majority of our incidents are somebody had a little too much to drink and, you know, they're wandering the lobby. What do you want me to do? Well, get them to their room or, you know, get them off the couch in the lobby and get them to their room. Um, but in the, <laughs> in the rare instance that we do have a, you know, a medical emergency, it's just a very clear communication mm -hmm. of, um, you know, what the next steps are after calling 911. I think um, while the facility is one fold of the whole situation now, even the programming is, is pushing or deriving the security or the protocols that you have in place. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> well, I can't get into too much detail, but um, just recently we, we had a situation that came up that we were gonna have this profile be part of our convention, but there was, a, there was an a, event uh, that happened where it kind of um, posterized uh, some of the background of that person's profile, et cetera. While there's no connection, while there's not even a, an ounce of any kind of um, you know, conspiracy, thinking, whatever you want to call it, uh, we started getting phone calls in the office like, hey, what are you guys doing about this? And I said, nothing. I mean, it's not yeah. connected. It, you, you, can't, you can't base anything off of one event to one person to what may be a domino effect. But it got to a point where 
we were pushed at the office so much that we had to make an executive decision. Um, we then also got in touch with this person and said, hey, look, we have not an issue of whatever the situation is. We know that there's no connection. We want to make sure that you're comfortable in yeah. being with us at that point. Um, and it came to a point where um, that person said, you know what, I'm going to have to pass on this. But on our side, we had to kind of re shuffle the whole situation, right? We don't want to be in a situation where we portray ourselves that we're not letting this person be part of our program, but we also have to look at it from a, an optic standpoint that how do we, how do we still survive in, in the, the mainstream media? Luckily we did, but to bring it back to what I meant about programming is that you know sometimes there are certain events that happen in the news or in, in geographic areas that may um, rise up on the controversial side whether you're in a city that mm -hmm. believes one thing and you're trying to do something else, well, it's not a bad situation, but you know, you're, you're trying to fulfill the membership piece um, or even on the keynote side, right? Um, it, it is very hard to secure maybe a keynote or someone even from the administration to be at your event six, eight months out. Mm -hmm. And they may not even tell you until six days or sometimes even six minutes before, like, hey, the governor's you know, two blocks away, he thinks he or she thinks that they can make it. And next thing you know, you've got canines <laughs> everywhere and it looks like a pedigree convention. Um, so all that, all that plays into the, the role of safety and security. But, uh, you know, the long story short is that it's twofold. It's a, it's a logistical facility piece of it. Yeah. And it's now also becoming a programming piece mm -hmm. of it because, um, you know, your attendees want to make sure, uh, they want to feel safe and you want to make sure they feel safe because you don't want to get those types of calls or the, that type of media press um, you know, going into or coming out of a convention. So yeah. um, I think it's a twofold from our side, but also on the, on the venue side is when, when you are looking at RFPs and bookings um, to ask yourselves that question that you know, if we do book this, it's a great piece of business, but let the ops teams know this could happen or even yeah. you know, a year out when you're planning things, um, you know, Google Alerts is the best thing that ever happened uh, to a, a lot of us that, that give us that notification, hey, something's going on on the other side of the world. Mm -hmm. Hey, I want to make sure we get to our last topic, which is contracts. So we'll kind of do it in an expedited way. I think I mentioned to you guys we might do like a lightning round and just give me a buzzword or a buzz phrase of the meetings industry that's on your mind right now. It seemed like most of them were going to kind of jive with the issue of contracts. Uh, anyway, so uh, here, Phelps, you want to, since you didn't get in on that last one, sorry, I owe you a conversation about safety and security. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, we can, we right. can stay on your uh, buzzword I'll keep contracts. it simple. Uh, I concur with everything that, that my esteemed panel has talked about, but it boils down to communication. Uh, part of the planning for communication, and then the other part is the chain of communication. So planning for communication. Do, you have, do we have emergency contacts for our attendees? So someone does have a medical issue or they're, gone lo they're lost or they're incapacitated somehow, do we have someone that we can reach out to? It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. uh, then with the building itself, what is the building's uh, security plan? What, what do they have? What is for fire and uh, evacuation or active shooter or medical situation? Mm -hmm. Uh, in some cases, especially the larger buildings, they don't want us to call 911 because it bypasses the in-house security. So the mm -hmm. police show up to a certain door and the security guys have no clue what's going on. Yeah. So it delays expediting the situation. So instead, they have a hotline and they, you know, we tell them to call 911. They immediately are patched to the local emergency response folks. So when they know where to show up and what's going on, and they're a part of an existing emergency plan. So have I communicated to the facility that we want their plan? Have I communicated to our staff or to, uh, to, the, to the leadership what those plans are so nobody goes off the reservation, if you will? Yeah. But it's all about communication, and as, as, as Kirsten said, um, you know, having a crisis plan, it, it may not be a 27-page document. It may be a, a single piece of paper, depending on the complexities of the program and how many people are involved and, and, and what's the threat level. Uh, threat level could be storms, threat level could be the environment we're in, uh, that we're in a certain part of town of a certain town that's having some issues. Uh, so whatever that might be, just being very conscious about it and communicating. So in our last three minutes here, I just want to touch on anything. I did say kind of what's your buzzword or what's, what's a topic of concern in the meetings industry. And if it can relate to contracts, let's just quickly go down the line, Kirsten, and then if we got time, Phelps, we'll end with you. 
Um, I think related to contracts, um, I think the diversity clause is something that more of us are trying to put into our contracts and a lot of you supplier folks don't really want to agree to, but you know, as states and uh, city and, and state legislators put um, legislation into place that maybe um, some organizations consider to be discriminatory um, or um, exclusive and things like that, I think we're looking to really be a diverse and including uh, meetings and organizations. We're challenged to put our, um, our meetings into those cities, so I think that is um, one thing that is becoming more and more popular and a little bit difficult to define, um, but something that is really on our radar screen to make sure that our meetings, uh, people that come to our meetings feel like they're inclusive. Um, I will say my other probably hot button issue is what I, is becoming more of a trend, which is the pre-walk, um, where it's like, well, we're gonna tell you six weeks out, 10 weeks out, that we've, over, we've sold into your block and we've oversold. Um, and we consider it not to be a walk because we're telling you six weeks out. And I think that, that it's becoming more and more common. Um, and I think that we're gonna start to see contract language change in order to yeah. help protect organizations mm -hmm. um, against that. We that wouldn't be the revenue sign margins. Margins. Yeah, yeah, right. Because I want to keep talking about that, but we'll do yeah. that afterwards. Right. But Nancy, yeah. what's your one hot topic? And I'm going to look very shallow um, now, right. but mine is um, AV liaison fees. Those just send me through the roof. We prefer to bring in outside AV, um, but I just am, I'm working on a contract right now, and they're trying to charge $350 per day per room for us to bring in outside AV. Um, and we're Worth working through every penny that. for the AV we've had today. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're working through it. Um, I think the, the biggest thing for us is the food and beverage. Um, the ops teams and the accountants need to understand that a dollar is a dollar, whether it's spent in your outlet or on the banquet side. Yeah. Um, you know, while I'm asking for maybe a lower room rate, I'm going to give you back hundreds of thousands of dollars in a different way. Um, and the teams just need to be more flexible because, as I said, a dollar is a dollar. doesn't matter how you dissect it on the back end, um, and it's going to one bank account. So on the selling side, it, it may make some of your lives a little easier, and uh, Starbucks makes a lot of money, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Phelps, unless you have a hey, buzzword. You know, the uh, the age-old is attrition fees. Um, mm -hmm. I'm seeing, you know, I, I, I agree that it needs to be put in place as a long time, last century I was a hotel sales guy, so I understood about sandbagging, but then uh, we, uh, oh, you want 500 rooms? Six, you're gonna grow, right? Yeah, 600 rooms, well, uh, at least it made us better business people by having attrition, but now it's turned into a revenue manager tool, and I'm seeing the, the uh, slippage allowance shrink. Yeah. Now I'm seeing very commonly 90% attrition, which makes it very, very hard for a a, a member-based organization who is attracting people to the conference rather than dictating that people attend the conference. Yeah. So being better business partners as we run into yeah. these clauses, the, the, the message I want to send is put it in context. Who is this body? What is the history? Who's managing it? How, how have we had problems in the past? Analyze the piece of business rather than just lean on the template and say, no, that's what it is and yep. I, can't, I can't move forward. So it's, it's about using the contract as a, as a, a written uh, a reinforcement of the agreement that we have come to as people, not the other way around. Well, Michelle, do we have any time for any uh, artificially planted or organically authentic <laughs> questions that might come from the audience? Yes, Lance? I'm going to go to Lance first. There's an authentic <laughs> planner question if i ever seen one. <laughs> First of all, I uh, resent being called artificial, David. <laughs> uh, I'm Lance Horniker. I represent Omni Hotels and Resorts. Um, I have a really simple question for the panel. Can you give us all an example of suppliers in the room of a wow site inspection moment? Who did it right? What did they do? That kind of thing. Mm. We don't need to see any more hotel rooms. We get it. There's a toilet yeah. in there. Um, at least for me, the site visit is all about showcasing the city at that point. Yeah. Um, the hotels are great, but like I said, we know what's in a hotel room. If it needs to be refurbished, you'll let us know, et cetera, what's the rate. But show us what the city looks like and how the hotel plays a role within that city. Um, and that's a, that's a good site visit for me. Yeah. Um, and um, when I see site visit agendas that have 10 hotels on them and we're going to see the sales managers, I respect you all. But with a timeline of where I'm there and what I need to do, it's all about the city at that point. 
And I actually don't want to be wowed during a site visit. I just want the realistic, I want the facts, I want to know that the receptions that I need to place in the city, that the venues can accommodate the receptions. I, I like site visits to be pretty straightforward. Um, you know, I don't mind a bottle of wine in the room, but um, I do like everything to be pretty straightforward during site visits. Yeah, I would agree. It's I think it's not so much about the wow, it's more about showing that you've done your research, mm -hmm. asking the right questions, understanding what the outcome is that I'm looking for with my meeting or with my group and what's important to me and then showing me those things. Mm -hmm. um, I'd rather, much rather, I mean, I'll take the bottle of wine yeah. room too, but um, I'd much rather um, know that you understand what, what I need as a group and that you're, and you're showcasing that than to, you know, be wined and dined or wowed or, yeah. you know, in that, in that sense. I, I would concur with that, but add one. So the wow for me, Lance. Well, two bottles of wine. Yeah, <laughs> the two bottles of wine. Uh, the wow for me, Lance, would be the homework that you've done that you understand the group coming in and now you, you're vested in our success so you understand that we, whatever the suite configuration we need or whatever, you know, the interactivity of these, these type of challenges that we've had. But the second part is, wow me with what makes your building facility, your employees, your staff, <laughs> the location, what makes it different? Yeah. So that I don't have to walk outside the hotel to remember what city I'm in. So that, you know, what makes it a little bit different? So what, you get guests through your property every single day. You hear it all day long. What about your destination is that wow moment? Mm -hmm. Well then bring that forward and demonstrate it, not the fact that you've just refurbished the ballroom. That's great, we expect that, that the ballroom's <laughs> gonna look great when we get there and the rooms are gonna have fresh soft goods and all the rest of it, but it's what makes your facility so much better. Yeah. Great, you got anything else out there? Oh, right. Do one quick one. Yeah. Let's, do, let's do two more, we'll do Karen. And oh, oh. Alex, I forgot Alex right next, I'm gonna go to Alex. <laughs> Good. Hey. As long as thank you. Cool First and foremost, thank you for all the panelists and um, our moderator. This is really, really insightful. So I'm Alex with Business Events Toronto, the world's most diverse city. My <laughs> question is for Kirsten. So about that diversity clause, um, how far does it go? Do you have like an odd clause? Should there be legislation um, against inclusivity? And have you been successful in implementing that clause? Um, we have been successful in implementing that clause. It is about legislation. Um, it is also about, you know, if a, a, like the facility is um, engaged in any kind of lawsuit around diversity and inclusion. Um, we've seen some of that over the, the years where you've had certain boycotts or maybe people have taken legal action against a hotel or a facility. Um, it's one of the clauses that definitely gets edited. Um, usually to tighten it up a little bit and not make it so broad. I think the challenge with the diversity clause is that it's, it, you, it's almost impossible to be inclusive of everything and it's different for every group, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, for, for, for one group it might be, you know, one issue and for another it might be another. And so trying to, it, the clause generally starts out pretty broad and I would, I find that in negotiations it tends to tighten up a little bit more. But it is about legislation in the city state, but it's also about, uh, you know, any legal action related to diversity and inclusion that may be taken against that facility. Karen, did you have a question? Oh, that's all right. Shout it out, Karen. <laughs> Come on, you're in theater. We, you'll have a projecting voice. Hi, I'm Karen Kotler. I, I work for Live Nation. Um, my question, is, we have over 55 venues across the country, and my question to all of you is, when you're looking for a unique venue that does have a lot of diversity, that is sustainably responsible as we are, and we are very high focused on branding to our corporate clients because that is a, about a 90% of who we're going after. And I'm talking about the House of Blues Entertainment and the other types of brands that we have. You know, we are a non-traditional, unique venue. So what are you looking for? How are you sourcing your offsite venues? Are you depending on your CVB and your DMCs to recommend venues to you? Are you looking at top capacities? Are you looking at seating styles? Um, I go through the CVB or whoever that main point of contact is. Um, our RFP is also pretty detailed at that point where um, I list out any venues that can house anywhere between 500 to 5,000 or 6,000 and I want that list in an Excel form. 
Um, <laughs> and I kind of give it, I, I basically do a template for that CVB person um, and they will then start inserting it. And what I do with that is a couple of things. One, I'll go through that list of venues that may work for my own receptions and large parties. But then I also pass on that list to the affiliates that are gonna be at our meeting, right? So I say, hey, I've already done the legwork. I know you need a venue for 100 people or 500 people. Here's 30 venues that I know is gonna be great for our people. Um, it's gonna be great for you. I've already done the legwork. Here's the food and beverage minimum. Here's the number of the salesperson, so go at it. So I, I know I'm taking on more than I should and I want, essentially, but um, it's helping me out, but it's also helping the, the city back out yeah. as well. Yeah, I go through the CVB as well, um, especially in a city where I'm unfamiliar. Um, I rely on them to show me venues that are within close proximity to the convention center and hotels where, that we'll be using. Mm -hmm. yeah. Same CVB. Yeah. Google, Google. Karen, keep your membership. <laughs> Oh, one. one more. Yep. Um, I just have a takeaway. Sarah McNeely, YPO Young Presidents Organization, and, and ties into health, wellness, drinking, and sponsorship, which is I get a She's sponsor them all. to do mimosas after yoga in the morning, yeah. and we get a lot of people to show up. <laughs> <laughs> that, so. I love a it. A good way to end it. That's great. Right. Yeah. Oxer, Nancy, Kirsten, Phelps, you were excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank um, you. Thank you. Awesome. I know, Chris Colbert, you have a drawing to do at the end here. Um, what are you giving away, Chris? Uh, CMA membership uh, for a, a planner. And uh, does everybody put their cards in here? The, the, the deal is you, you can't be a current, uh, you can't be a current, uh, uh, you can't be, have a current membership. This, you need to be a non-member planner. All right. Thank you. <laughs> um, if we draw Lydia's name, it's free final four tickets for everyone. <laughs> Kimberly Jackson with the Sheraton. Oh. <laughs> Although I think that's a supplier. Oh, Kimberly. Kimberly, I think oh. you're a supplier. Sitting right next to Chris. I'm sorry, honey. <laughs> You'll win the next thing. Paulette. Good job. Yay. All right, I think that's it, everyone. There are surveys on your ch uh, tables. If you guys wouldn't mind taking just a couple minutes to fill them out, it really helps us out. So. Unless there's anything else from anybody, thank you. Thank, thank you to you. our thank wonderful you. panel. Appreciate awesome, it. Awesome, guys. Oh, sure, good to meet you, man. Thanks.